to take this opportunity, first of all, to to welcome our wonderful guests, um, uh, Giles Keating, um, the former chief economist and global head of research at Credit Suisse is with us here today uh, to talk about this really, really important topic. And also Professor Simon Evening from the University of St. Gallen and founder of the Global Trade Alert, which is a, a think tank focused on, on, on predicting, measuring uh, uh, global trade volumes and, and also uh, policies. Yeah. Uh, so, so we've invited these sort of luminaries, two luminaries, to discuss with us the impact of a, a topic that has not been this relevant in the past 30 years, perhaps, the topic of inflation, what impact that has uh, on asset markets, we'll discuss in a second as well. And we'd also like to invite very many questions from the audience uh, 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 to direct them at Giles and at, and, at, and Simon. Um, but I'd like to start, first of all, with, with Giles and just ask you the first question. It seems the last time people, commentators, spoke about inflation in this, with this sense of urgency seems to be more in the 70s, you know, when inflation hit 20% and really became a big, big, big topic. Since then, central banks have shifted their focus on price control more towards employment, financial stability, overweighting those issues relative to inflation. Um, do you think that the current alarming rates, perhaps, of, of nearly 5% in the Eurozone, um, uh, 6% in, 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 in the US, even Japan is receiving in, uh, uh, is, 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 has some inflation. Is this something that you feel is transitory or is it something that could be more enduring? I, 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 it, my feeling is that the current very high rates have obviously got an element of basis effect and temporary effect in them. So I think any central forecast has to be that they'll edge back a bit. However, so they, in that sense, there's a transitory element. But I really think that there are a lot of things that mean that inflation over the next several years is likely to have moved on a rather higher path than we've been used to. And in particular, I think a lot of the deflationary bias in the system has now dropped out. And why do I think that? I think it's because globalization really has changed. It's not that it's completely come to an end, um, but uh, equally, it's not just temporary blockages at ports and so on. Trade tensions uh, are so high now. National security, the sort of split between the US and, and China uh, and so on. All of that, I think, means that that intense competitive world it is not the one we've been used to for the last 25 years. Um, and I think, you, you know, tech has become highly oligopolistic, very difficult to kind of see that when we get services for free. But, you know, the advertising, the marketing has got this iron grip of the Facebooks and the Googles and so on um, and, and so on. And we could chuck in all sorts of other things about the great retirement, people withdrawing the labor force and so on. But but I think all of that makes me feel there is a permanent element to inflation here. Is it something that worries you, Giles? And when you say permanent, is it something that is, I mean, are we heading back to the 1970s? Is this going to be a salient political, not just economic, but political issue? Well, I mean, in, in Germany, it already is a big political issue. You've just got to look at the German tabloids screaming about inflation. Um, but I think that uh, it, it's, I, I would phrase it slightly differently and say, it puts the central banks, I think, in a slightly, well, a distinctly difficult position. Um, they have, I, I think they've been uh, focusing on deflation risk for so long. Their policy levers are all set that way. And they were trying to get out of that. And then along came the pandemic. And the result is that I think they are, they're moving into kind of tightening mode rather late. 
Um, and so while that doesn't mean perhaps we're on the borders of 1970s inflation, I wouldn't suggest that, but it does create a really difficult policy dilemma in trying to extract a bit late from an over easy policy. Very good point. So if, I'd like to just move to Simon and, and sort of supply chain dynamics. I mean, trade volumes have and corrected sharply at the beginning of the pandemic. But in the last 18 months, they corrected sharply. They've actually improved quite well. What is what is your view? Do, do you see that this is more something that is potentially transitory or also more enduring? Well, here I think I would lean more to the disruptions being a bit transitory, but uh, but in the sense of needing maybe six and up, even up to 18 months to get back to normal. So th I don't know if that tra counts as medium term, but it's certainly not, it's not something that's going to turn around in two quarters. I mean, we really do have an incredible dislocation in the world shipping fleets from where they should be. Uh, so that's, I think, so that, uh, and that point I think has been very, uh, well documented. So yes, I think we will have um, disruption there. Of course, this is going to have implications for um, the prices of goods, which, as we know, have uh, have risen considerably. Um, so yes, I think that's a that's a feature there. I also buy uh, Giles's argument that um, uh, you know trade as a factor which is depressing prices is probably going to be less important going forward, especially since we have. I mean, it's not just a matter of decoupling between U.S. and China. I mean, China is openly championing decoupling on its side with respect to manufacturing and sourcing and the like uh, and supplying so much more domestically. So I think we are going into a rather unusual phase. It is it is a reset of the assumptions, I think, about the global economy that we're having here. With, we'll have, a, I think, a, a trading economy, which is probably still going to remain relatively open, but so, still subject to a huge amount of policy-based uncertainty as the competition goes between firms in marketplaces to between governments, defense ministries, foreign ministries. I mean, that's a, that's where the, com the competition is now. And of course, this bleeds huge amounts of uncertainty into trading relationships and, and uh, provides less assurance that uh, imports will take up the slack whenever demand uh, rises above trend. And it is, I mean, when you say, is this the end of globalization? It sounds extremely melodramatic. Please excuse. Is it, or, or is it, is, 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 would you, this trend that we've seen over the last four decades that has lifted so many people out of poverty, do you, are you very concretely, Simon, is, are, are we seeing, do you expect a reversal of this trend? And what would that mean? Okay, so I think one has to break it down. I think that. There's a greater risk of either stagnation and a little bit of reversal in trading in goods. Um, in that particular domain, I think you could see that. Could see that. Um, in when it comes to trade and services, and in particular digital services, this is just taking off. So this is that that part of globalization is pretty safe. Where we are seeing a lot of retrenchment is in foreign direct investment. If you scale FDI by world GDP or world uh, fixed capital formation. We're back down to levels we haven't seen since 1995. So it's so yeah. that side of globalization is doing pretty badly. So I would say the you know it's it's a very very mixed picture. And the more that economies are service based, and many of them are, and the more there's cross border, the trade in services maybe that's that's the future of uh, growth for globalization. But and here's the big but: once more and more people's jobs start coming under pressure due to cross border competition from foreign service providers. Uh, we may see a, a protectionist backlash like we've never seen before, because there's a lot of there's a lot of people who've, you know, who it, well let's just put it bluntly, if you want to have a um, quiet life, don't go and work in the manufacturing sector, competitive yeah. manufacturing sectors, right? Yeah. If really you want a quiet life, become a divorce lawyer in Appenzell or some uh, some <laughs> other, yeah, you know, something like this. Uh, and uh, those, you know, the, those. The people who've hidden in the service sector to avoid competition are not going to value, not going to welcome this, uh, revi you know, this increase in cross-border um, uh, pressure. But um, I do think if globalization has a future, it's going to be on the service, especially on the digital services side, and there's huge amounts to grow there. Okay. I guess that's on terms of outcomes. If you're talking about you know, globalization as seen by trade agreements and the like, I mean, quite frankly, the era of big trade agreements is probably over.
this is okay. that's so it's back to unilateral policy some governments will make smart decisions many will make dumb decisions and uh, that it will play out i think you'll, you'll get a lot of a lot more country-based differentiation i think in terms of trade policy okay so i quickly want to get onto this point giles may, may, fdi or or carry on giles may i just bring oil and energy into the equation here oh yes because uh, that's such another important aspect of the whole inflation thing and it's obviously and here I'd just like to make the point that there's clearly an incredible tension going on, uh, not irrelevant to the foreign direct investment thing, but an incredible tension in, in the energy between, on the one hand, the desire of governments for climate change and energy security reasons to move towards renewables, but on the other hand, the reaction that that's producing in the fossil fuel producers, who, and I'm obviously thinking of Saudi and Russia particularly, yeah. Um, who have a very, particularly Russia, a very uneasy relationship with the West, uh, but who in a way are in a rather sort of superior or elevated bargaining position for a sort of a, a very long transitional period measured in many years, not in months, the next 15 years or 20 years, while there's still enormous demand for fossil fuels because the renewables haven't come on stream, the, the electrification hasn't yet occurred, etc., and, and uh, you know, they, they basically signaled that they are almost at war uh, mm. with the West over that. And I mean, the furious reaction of Saudi Arabia to the release of the strategic oil reserves, which, by the way, I thought was an idiotic move. You can't fight a flow with a stock, which is what Biden was trying to do. You use that stock just for short term disruptions, not to fight a long term uh, game thing. So so I think that you know, basically the oil producers and gas producers have told us they will crank their prices up whenever they can. Would that, could not that potentially be accelerate the transition though? I mean, really short term in for, 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 for headline inflation, that would be a catastrophe. It's very, it's actually very double edged because on the one hand, higher fossil fuel prices e accelerate the, the switch to renewables. On the other hand, um, they make the West a lot, you know, less firm about um, not investing in the stuff yes. because they want their security. So very, very double edged. Yeah. What, what is your opinion, Simon, uh, on this? Well, I think um, I think Giles is really uh, right to point to the, the energy dimension here. I mean, I think what we're seeing, whether we look at COP26 or national plans, is that uh, governments are um, absolutely screwing this transition up. I mean, we have, the, the or, or let me put it this way, there is a big mismatch between uh, with which governments want to move and, and the signals being received by the, um, uh, the oil producers and the like, many of whom are just simply cutting back on CapEx. Uh, and so we really risk um, essentially significant capacity constraints outside of the Russia's and the Saudi Arabia's of the world. So you can imagine us running up against those constraints every time we have a demand increase. And then we fall into the laps of um, the policymakers in the Kremlin and in uh, Riyadh. So you, you know, this this is uh, from an energy security point of view, um, very, being very poorly handled. Maybe the big mistake is to think about this in terms of clean fuel versus dirty fuel rather than a continuum of, of different types and where you move progressively away from the dirtier fuels towards gas and then towards renewables you know and you keep you keep the investments targeted in the towards the more cleaner fuels but uh, we don't you know this is a process of transition not something which is going to flick a switch and much of the policy making and dialogue about this seem really is seems to me to be very naive not really thinking about how to manage this transition very well yeah, it's a com it's a complex transition, right? With very, very, very many stakeholders, you know, with with yeah. altering interests. Um, you 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 mentioned correctly that capex is actually down. Is this? I don't want to relate that to foreign direct investment. Why? I didn't even know that it was that low. That foreign direct investment is is at ninety ninety five levels. Why is it that low? Uh, okay, so I. I've looked into this earlier in the year, and um, by the way, it's at 95 volts, not in um, in nominal terms, but when you correct for the size of the growth of the world economy. So that's the way to think about this. Um, so uh, FDI is not contributing as much as it it did uh, uh, for, uh, for compared to the early phase of globalization. Now, why? I think the principal 
reason that I can, I've been able to establish is that the returns on FDI are actually falling quite significantly. The only country we have really good data for this on is the United States. And with my team, we went back several decades and looked across um, uh, emerging markets versus other countries. And one of the most striking findings, especially in the last five to 10 years, is that the premium on FDI returns in emerging markets has converged uh, to that for American firms to the, the FDI returns they can get in the European Union. Okay. And if that's the case, why take the risk of investing in the emerging markets? There's no risk premium. Yeah. Can I just chuck in another thought on that? I mean, um, 20 years ago, the Chinese capital market was didn't really exist at all. Mm. Uh, you now have, you know, we've just seen, you know, ever green blow up and so on, but it's not, it's not perfect. It's still quite immature, but it does exist big time. Um, and I think a lot of other countries uh, for reasons of security and perhaps help by, uh, you know, governments and so on, uh, are also very keen to do their own investment. So, I, I, I mean, I think that the, the I mean, uh, yeah, and I love your statistics, Simon, about the, the um, what do you call it, the equalization of the returns, as it were, yeah, yeah, super. But so, so I'm sure that's all part of it. But at the same time, you've got internal sources of, of capital which just did not exist 25 years ago. Okay. I'm sure you're right, Charles. That there's a, certainly a, the, the demand for overseas financing has probably gone down, right? We have, so emerging markets was most self financing more. On top of that, we do have lower returns. We, have, of course, have seen lower returns in many other assets classes as well. But uh, I do wonder what must it be like to be a, a CFO in some of these board meetings in multinationals, looking at the projected returns and looking at the actual returns from the past, asking, should we really? Uh, allocate another billion here or there, and maybe that helps and uh, helps us understand uh, why FDI is in retreat. I should also say, by the way, the policy towards FDI, especially in the last year or so, has become markedly more adverse with all these national sec uh, security screening mechanisms. And yep. although a lot of that stuff has been set up to uh, to screen Chinese investments, we are seeing um, uh, oh. essentially ch a chilling effects for other countries' overseas investments, too, even amongst allies. So, uh, so I think that's another factor which is um, taking the uh, taking the air out of the FDI balloon. Okay, very, very good. Uh, I wonder if we can just very quickly also talk about, um, in addition to supply chains, um, central bank policy, um, and this this whole idea that over the last, um, I would decade since the financial crisis, every single well, uh, industrialized world's central bank has been focused on on driving inflation higher um, uh, as part of a, a, a goal to increase employment, um, uh, secure more financial stability. And, and now it seems that gears need to be shifted really, really, really quickly. Who, maybe Giles, to you first, who do you think is running an, an, an adequate central bank policy at this point? Who, which central bank governor is, uh, is, 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 is best prepared for the cur current dislocation that the world is experiencing? I, I mean, if I come to that in a moment, Robert, and perhaps stick my neck out a bit and say, I'm afraid I do think that central bank policy over the last 15 years or so has been based on a really fundamental misunderstanding which is the idea that, that consumer price inflation, or to be more exact, consumer price deflation, poses a, a real risk to economic stability. That's the way they've been thinking. And for good reasons in theory, because you think if you don't have positive consumer price inflation, how on earth do you service um, debt? Uh, you, you know, you're in a, in a kind of debt trap for servicing debt. But the, the, but they, I think there is a misunderstanding that actually asset capital goods prices um, matter at least as much, if not more, in terms of limiting deflation risk. Because if capital goods prices are on an uptrend, then you've got the collateral and you've got the incentive to keep investing. Um, and you will be able to issue equity capital and forms of debt 
uh, that, that are structured in a way where that can cope with consumer price deflation. So I, I think that has been a, a tragedy, actually. And central banks have, in, a, in effect, thrown the policy book at trying to mm. boost consumer price inflation and sort of allowed capital goods price inflation and, and uh, capital asset price inflation to go through the roof, when what they should have done was to be targeting a kind of a modest, sustainable growth in capital goods price inflation and accept some modest consumer goods price inflation. But they became absolutely obsessed with this 2% number, which, yeah. if I recall correctly, was invented by the Bank of Canada um, in, in the early 80s, I think. It was a completely arbitrary number that came out of thin air. It goes completely against Milton Friedman, who'd originally said modest consumer price deflation is actually the most efficient. Uh, it was an utter nonsense and it became embedded. You know, it had its purpose at the beginning. And that's all a long-winded way of saying that I think the central banks have actually, they, they've over-egged this and the result has been a big um, asset price inflation instead of uh, the kind of modest asset price inflation that we needed. And now unwinding that becomes astonishingly difficult. They're all caught in the eyes of the headlights. If they start over-tightening policy, there'll be a terrible crash in asset markets. And of course, that will damage um, uh, I I investment and capital formation massively, uh, and then there'll be a recession. So, so that, I think, is their problem. Um, and getting out of that is immensely difficult. Mm. Um, you know, the Fed is trying to do it, but, you know, we can see a string of mistakes, even apart from that very fundamental one, but, you know, in terms of this talk of transitory inflation and so on, with hindsight. Hindsight's easy, except that I think they started from this wrong policy framework. So I, I mm. do blame them for using that. Very difficult, Robert, to pick out one central bank that sort of is doing it right, to be absolutely honest. Mm. You know, I'd like to look around some of the smaller economies in the world and say, you know, they're, they're perhaps doing it a little bit better. But, you know, as a small open economy, you're so much enthralled to what the big ones are doing. If you start tightening policy too much, your exchange rate goes through the roof and you're completely, you know, bad. So, yeah. Difficult. Well, that it, it, it may be if this continues this trend. Um, I mean, it, it, a lot of central banks will be forced to do just that: to to raise interest rates and and suffer uh, uh, much higher exchange rates. I mean, thank goodness in Switzerland, the inflation is not as elevated yet, but uh, it, it's it's heading in this direction as well. Uh, Giles, social stability. You mentioned increasing asset prices, so 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 tremendous increases in as asset prices, which clearly also lead to higher concentrations of wealth. Um, and in an that's fine if you're an asset holder. If you're not an asset holder, the increases of inflation actually affect some parts of broader society more. Than others, and this is probably why you 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 cited the German Boulevard uh, magazines that are already quite alarmist about inflation. The people that who have not benefited from the asset price inflation are being hit highest by consumer price inflation. Do you see is that as a social risk? I, I mean, clearly there has been this really, I think, unintended and appalling transfer of wealth. Um, which I, I don't know if by social risk we mean what we mean, but I mean, we can obviously mean political politics political, yeah. away from the centre in a way that we don't like and or that what don't like is a very strong word, but that in a way that can be destabilising to, 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 to the governmental system. So, so I think there have been very unfortunate side effects of this. And as I said a moment ago, if only the central banks had targeted modest inflation in yeah. asset prices, not worried about a bit of deflation in consumer prices, then we would be in a much better position. But now we've had this extreme inflation in asset prices. And yes, it's had distributional consequences that have absolutely left so many people on the margins in many countries. And, mm. and, that, that, and it really grim. And then there are knock-on effects as well, because governments then end up having to do much bigger transfer programs. And so that puts pressure on you know, government debt sort of looks OK at the moment, but that's another risk that, that lies in the future and so on and so on. 
Uh, yeah, Simon, I wonder if you could say something about your views on the central bank policies. Is it something that you support the policies of the last 10, uh, 10 uh, 11 years, or, or, or is also something that you criticize could have been done differently? Well, I'll be honest, my views have evolved over time. I'm a Cambridge-trained Keynesian who was always very skeptical about monetary policy. So remember Keynes's remark <laughs> about pushing on a string. So I was always a little bit skeptical that uh, it was going to work. And I uh, and uh, yet at the same time, of course, when the, you know, the asset market markets dried up, there was clearly a need for liquidity support then. But then what came afterwards, I think, has made me more and more nervous over time uh, for the reasons that uh, well, I mean, like you can be worried about this on grounds of effectiveness. Has this actually really worked? You can worry about the um, the, uh, the the social dislocation or the inequalities which have been created, which have clearly fueled some um, uh, more extreme politicians. And then I think you also have to ask yourself, what's the exit plan from all of this? Um, uh, when How can you normalize policy, a monetary policy, uh, given what has happened? And um, Giles has already highlighted the potential risk to asset prices. Do, uh, do we honestly think that a that a central banker these days in one of the major jurisdictions is willing to or will be able to allow a 20 or 30 percent sustained fall in asset prices in order to tackle price inflation i'm not sure about that which leads me to because i think the pressures on them will be intense think about who i mean who are the groups which support the current policy these are the people who have benefited enormously from these asset price increases if they walk away and don't support current uh, central bank policy who's left to support it which makes me ask a deeper question, which is, do we think that as uh, monetary policy normalization is attempted, uh, that these central bankers will essentially lose their independence? You could argue that they have, by and large, lost a lot of their independence the moment they decided to buy up and finance huge amounts of government debt, right? They've essentially mm -hmm. become a financing arm of the state. Mm -hmm. So um, is the central bank independence of, in 2021 more nominal than real? is the question I would ask. Mm. Um, that's, I think that, uh, and I can, and, and course, credibility in terms of sure. sort of stewards of cr price control, sure. I think and could please. also be in danger, yeah. Yeah, I, I think, think I, 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 if, if, sorry, sorry. If, if you want my quick take on, you, you know, forecasts are always dangerous, but let's, should we just try a scenario, a central scenario for next year, which is that uh, as the Fed starts to taper, uh, we get the most, enormous sell-off in the longer end of the treasury market. The hedge funds are always nibbling away trying to do that, and then they they get beaten back. But but as soon as tapering gets underway, in, in reality, they will succeed. And, and it won't just be that the Fed won't be buying as much uh, a, 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 as many assets. It, will, it also percolates right the way through the whole system to the banks, uh, yeah. who are kind of the, the purchasers of choice in the treasury market. Uh, the odd remaining um, uh, defined benefit pension fund, all of these people drop out and you'll get a horrible sell-off at the long end, uh, which will, you know, sort of around the same time, large parts of the equity market will sell off sharply. And, and Simon, I noticed you used the word uh, sustained 20 to 30 percent fall, which I thought was a very nice way to put it. Uh, you, it so my this kind of scenario, you would get uh, 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 whatever number it might be, 20, 30, who knows, uh, fall in, 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 in many asset markets. Um, and at that point, the central banks would have to, or the Fed would have to row back in some way. And how much they would row back, we don't know exactly. Um, and I mean, the, the, the good outcome from all of that could be a kind of shakeout in, in which, as it were, the kind of the tide that has lifted all boats, the kind of jam spread that's kind of spread across the bread, whatever metaphor you want, that has kind of made everything look tasty. Um, it, you know, all of a sudden, we'll, we're after a shock like that, you'll end up with only the kind of areas, renewable energy or, or biotech, whatever it is, that really, really do add genuine value, that those are the ones that will kind of emerge from that, that mess uh, and, and recover perhaps over, over a period of time, whereas others uh, it won't. So, so that's what I kind of like to see, or I sort of, if we do have a nasty incident like that, but what I'd like to see happen, and that doesn't always happen, but, but, but in, in short, a kind of a, a return to a bit more rationality. Uh, and, and I'm not in the camp of saying that nothing uh, 
uh, you know, that everything has gone up crazy amounts, you know, that to take one very topical example, Tesla, you know, many people love to hate that, but excuse me, you know, they've invented viable electric cars. They actually don't sit on the fringes whinging about somebody else building a charging network. They actually go and build it themselves, etc. So who knows their exact value, but they deserve a very, very high valuation. But then you've got lots of other stuff out there that doesn't. And so some kind of shakeout, I think, could, could be really quite permanent. And this is something you would expect over the last next 12 months, Giles? Uh, look, I hesitate to make forecasts, but I think it's a credible scenario as the Fed moves towards tapering and eventually rate rises. And in that context, how would you personally reposition a portfolio if that were to be true as the central scenario? Uh, you, 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 you either through your own research or by employing a, a very, very good uh, manager, you focus on those assets that really do hit the medium term zeitgeists that really are going for the technologies that, that really are needed in the next five plus years and identify those companies, even if they look quite expensive now, they probably aren't and keep away from a lot of the of other things that, that are overvalued. So in an equity space, what about in an asset class uh, uh, context? Um, what what kind of asset classes would you avoid? Which would you which which would you prefer? I, I, I mean, I really do think that that up to a point, the day of reckoning is coming uh, for for duration. I think that yields are, in this scenario are likely to to end up significantly high, longer dated yields so in twelve year twelve months time from now. That's a good Freudian slip, 12 years. But uh, <laughs> and, and, you know, we've been saying that many people have said that again and again over the last 12 years. And it's been you know, not quite. They've, been, they've obviously come off the bottom. But but I think that, that, that we are at that point now at long last. Um, so so I would actually avoid duration, uh, although, of course, the whole point is that most of the people who buy duration are the ones who have to buy it. Yeah, they and don't have a choice. At that point, uh, yeah. Um, uh, crypto is another whole topic which we could talk about for hours, but I would, uh, I, I mean, ultimately, I think crypto will, Im will be extraordinarily volatile through this, but will actually emerge looking pretty good. Um, and, you know, there are all sorts of complex issues about, you know, whether Ether can kind of retain its crown and all that sort of thing, but um, a crown in terms of operational use, et cetera, et cetera. But, but I think net net there, there actually is a lot of underlying value there. Um, and what else are we looking at? I mean, property, surely, um, you know, it's a long duration asset. It's going to underperform um, in general, longer duration stuff, you know, with where the income streams are longer duration are going to underperform. OK, uh, Simon, I, I'm going to get to crypto in just a minute, uh, Giles. Um, but Simon, what is what is your view? Is, 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 do you think this is also um, plausible over the next 12 months or sort of over the next, the medium term that, that one has a sort of a more significant correction in asset markets based I, on the, on the ta tapering trend? Yes. I mean, I, I, I do think there is a risk of this, especially if tapering, uh, well, depending on how tapering is managed and then, you know, how quickly interest rates are increased. Um, I think there is a, a room for serious correction. I, all I would add to what Giles has said, I, I mean, is the following. We've been looking here in St. Garden and the, certainly in the US markets at the number of zombie firms. So these are firms which have loaded up on huge amounts of debt uh, and their operating income you know, either doesn't cover their interest or barely covers it. You have to ask yourself what's, uh, what's going to be the percentage of zombie firms uh, if interest rates start normalizing. At the moment, we see a big split between the larger firms. There's only about 10% of them. These are the publicly listed companies, which are zombies. But when you get to the the companies in the bottom half of the distribution, already half of them are, are zombies. Mm. So what, so there may be a shakeout large versus small as well, which it could be worth it. And that might actually lead, if, if the shakeout really hits the small and the medium sized publicly listed companies, then all the talk about sort of the, the 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 large firms, the concentrated winners, and all the rest of it's going to take off even further. So I wonder if there's a a, a size split as well that we should factor into the scenarios.
So Simon, but if you believe that the 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 in degree of independence of central banks has perhaps been undermined over the last years, can central banks allow that to happen? Well, I think they, in many ways, they've almost felt compelled to act in the way that they had done. They were, remember, let's not forget one of the books re, 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 written in recent years was called Central Bank's The Only Game in Town, right? Uh, so I think they've felt that they've had to pick up the slack because um, fiscal policymakers weren't uh, doing um, enough. And then, of course, we have the pandemic and the fiscal policymakers do come in with huge stimulus packages. And what do the central banks do? They buy up loads of that debt. So, I mean, who, who is, you know, if if, it's, if we're talking about a dog and a tail, who, who's wagging the dog's tail? Who is the tail and who is the dog here? Yeah. Um, so, you know, it, they may not have lost their formal independence. There's no, I mean, sorry, let's be clear. They have not lost their formal independence. Um, but uh, their actual operational room for manoeuvre, how much do they really have uh, mm. and in, in the current situation and going and, forward? And and that's, just, that's what makes me wonder. It's so as you say, it makes me wonder how far they can go on normalising uh, monetary policy. And Charles, what do you let's think? Let's just chuck in here that, of course, fiscal policy is set for another year of big expansion in 2022. You've got Biden's programme, which may or may not get augmented. And then in Germany, you've just got a new government that is absolutely set to do that and seems to have got a kind of thick book of creative accounting to help it do it um, yeah. and, and, and so on. So, so um I, I, that I, I agree, Simon, makes it very difficult for the central banks as they try and withdraw their support for government bonds just at the point where the governments want to print even more of them. Yeah. yeah. And and if, if one factors in the zombie firm, uh, in addition to that, the, the, the risk that l uh, many companies um, go insolvent or illiquid um, the question is whether central banks can really allow that to happen en masse. Um, it's going to be interesting to see. Uh, but I think the topic of inflation continues. Yeah. And in and, and this context, this is also the fear of which was the impetus for the creation of Bitcoin um, uh, in, in 2009. Um, uh, Simon, do you see cryptocurrencies? as a viable hedge against inflation risk? I think I, I have my doubts. I mean, I think there's we've witnessed so much instability in crypto prices that you'd be very, I mean, there, there will be people who will charge in, I'm sure. But um, can we honestly think that many, well, do we think that many, many uh, you know, the majority of people will see it as a hedge? Probably not. I don't know. I fear, but I, I, I kind of, Let's hear what Giles has to say about this. I'm a little bit sceptical on that front. I, I mean, I guess I'd say that if I look across a, a, a broader crypto universe, then I, 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 rather than sort of starting from the idea that we're talking about currencies, I think it's a lot more helpful to, to think that we are talking about um, equity assets, uh, which uh, effectively are the both the, the capital raising mechanism for uh, a an operational system uh, that people are prepared to pay money to use um, much like many um, well much like any kind of tech startup if you like and except that they're no longer startups in the early phases of their of their life many of them are now well established and and doing a lot of stuff. Um, and so uh, a, a equity assets, coming back to my earlier idea, that genuinely offer um, output that people want to buy and which is going to grow over time because it's a, a, a new technology which actually addresses, uh, you know, does a lot of things much cheaper, faster, more securely and better uh, than they're being done at the moment. Um, I think all of that creates a natural flow of money into into crypto, which is a very different one from the kind of mad speculative in and out that we that we do tend to see driving some of the, the, the recent wild price swings. And I think in that regard, I found it really interesting the way that the volatility of Bitcoin that we've seen over the last two weeks has not been mirrored um, in uh, Ether 
which has been radically less volatile. Um, I mean, at least, uh, it, 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 you know, if, if, if Bitcoin fell 30 plus percent within the space of about 10 days, um, Ether, if I recall correctly, certainly on any part from any very short term spikes, was barely down more than 10 percent um, and, and, you know, can almost be characterized as sort of, you know, it's been a lot more stable, for example, than Tesla. And I think that's quite a nice sort of flavor where you it got in it what amounts to a something that can best be compared to the, 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 the stock of a tech company. And I think that's a much better way to think about it. And, and it's all a bit odd because it's, it's a bit like a private equity that's not traded on. It's, it's almost like crypto is almost like a private equity in which there is a very, very active gray market. That's perhaps a nice way to think of it. Um, and that, that the technology is being used more and more and more. And people laugh or people who are not involved in the NFT market kind of laugh almost at the NFT market and say, oh, well, that's all about selling artwork at inflated prices. But actually, NFTs are a way to create copyright and control copyright on an Internet that tries to make it e that, that, where it's very difficult to look after your copyright. And, and I actually think NFTs will, will just grow bigger and bigger and bigger. I think they'll you know, move into the music industry very rapidly. Uh, I think they can move into all sorts of things that need copyright protection. And, and, and it's crypto that is the engine that drives the NFT market. Okay. So, I mean, I, I, just to play uh, um, uh, devil's advocate here a little bit, I mean, it, it, comparing it to an equity investment, you actually become an owner of a company that produces stuff. Yeah. And, and, and uh, 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 you know, it, with with crypto, it's actually a currency supposedly used as a means to buy stuff. And I haven't as yet bought a coffee as yet with with Bitcoin. Maybe that will come. But my my question now is, what is you saw a thirty percent reduction in price in Bitcoin? Where did that reduction in price come from is the first point. And then sort of leading on to that, what is the, where is the demand coming from? Is it speculation more? Um, or are they, uh, apart from speculation, a lot of equity investors don't just buy equity because they, 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 they just hope that they'll be able to sell it from someone else, sell it to someone else at a higher price later, but because they like to own actual tangible companies, be part of, 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 of a company. So what where, first thing is, where is the, the correction come from? Why did the correction come from? And where is the demand coming from? What are people be, besides speculation, I guess? Well, I mean, I mean, I think that those questions are very easy to answer. So the the Bitcoin price fell a lot because there were very big speculative positions by hedge funds and others, and they got liquidated at a time when when speculative positions were being liquidated in response to, to Jay Powell uh, saying that he was going to be tightening policy faster than you thought. It was just a natural development. By contrast, Ether didn't have anywhere near such big um, speculative positions, and it corrected far, far less. So that, that mm. you know, I think the price dynamic is very clear. And then as to your question about, oh, they're not really like an equity. Well, actually, they are. I mean, you buy a bank equity. What are you actually buying? You're buying a kind of clapped out old computer system and a whole bundle of overpaid people who can up and off to the next competitor at any moment uh, unless they get paid, you know, an amount equal to almost the entire rent that the bank is own, earning. Whereas when you buy, say, uh, something, you know, any of the cryptocurrencies that you can stake uh, and you, you do indeed stake the cryptocurrency, you actually are being paid uh, for the transaction fees that people uh, are willingly paying in order to carry out transactions. And I don't mean transactions buying a cup of coffee. I mean buying an NFT that allows them to own the, either own the copyright or certain property rights on an artwork or a piece of music or a bottle of wine or whatever it may be, or indeed, um, and, and then we can go from there to the logistics services that blockchain can provide and all the rest of it. So, so I'm, when I, I, I am, it is like buying an equity because I'm 
I have the ability to earn an income stream from uh, the the computer system, in effect, that is that is doing this work. It's like it's as though I could, you know, uh, own a share in Credit Suisse or UBS if they had a decent computer system, which they don't. If I could own, own a share direct in the underlying computer system and not have to worry too much about all the bankers. Very interesting. So, Simon, what do you, let, let me, very good, interesting point, Giles. Let me get to you, Simon, and ask you maybe uh, relate this back to the concept of central banks. Uh, how do you see the prospect of central bank digital currencies? And, and maybe to both of you, is this a threat or an opportunity for for um, for the for the more mainstream um, uh, uh, recognition of of the, the the pioneering currencies? Oh, it's a really interesting question. I, I I guess I lean more towards this being an opportunity. I think that that, that they can. I mean, it, or, let, or, let, or let, let me just put it this way. Do we honestly believe that in, in 100 years time, we will still be talking about currencies in the same way, I, way we are now? I think not. I mean, I think people, what they want, will want from currencies may stay the same, but the way in which we use them will change remarkably. So and we have to move into this space. That I, I just think that the, they're tiptoeing at the moment and they probably should be moving a little faster. Giles, what do you think? Central bank digital currencies? Well, I, I mean, I completely agree with Simon that they should be moving a lot faster. And of course, it's in China, they are moving very fast. Um, and there they're doing it because they regard, it, I think, I, I don't have an inside track, but it certainly looks as though it's to do with a culture of control, uh, at which, which mm. uh, it, you know, I think fits with the, the way they're going. And, and that's also why, why they effectively tried to ban much of the use of cryptocurrencies there. Um, it, it, I think in the Western countries, I agree with Simon very much. It's a pity that that the move is so slow into digital currencies, I, I, and one or two places are moving much faster. One to the smaller countries. Um, I think the very nice thing is that if they're designed well, and and this requires a regulatory and technological effort, then they can actually really there can be a wonderful marriage between. The, the central bank digital currencies and the cryptocurrencies, which actually between the two just creates something really powerful and strong. The, the central bank digital currency is the normal medium of exchange for normal day-to-day -day transactions, uh, but then the cryptos provide the background engine that kind of runs the system. Wow. Well, you you know a lot, uh, uh, Mr. Keating, uh, about so it, <laughs> about crypto. It's amazing. So my question now is, as an holder of crypt, cryptocurrencies, the China banned Bitcoin and other crypto transactions, and I'm not sure exactly exactly why they did that. That they, but they, the fact that they did that. Um, I think invites the question, what is the risk that other countries, nation states, ban the cryptocurrencies? Well, I think if you'd asked me that a year ago, even though China hadn't yet made their move at that time, I would have said that risk was really quite significant. I think from what we've seen since then, I, I would say it's actually shrunk very dramatically. And I'm particularly thinking of the way that in the U.S., there is now a very substantial move towards regulation rather than banning. Uh, mm -hmm. And we had a, a very rather brief, uh, and I could even almost say cryptic um, message from the main regulatory bodies that came out uh, about two or three weeks ago, which I thought was very encouraging because they've, they've agreed to proceed as one, because that's been one of the problems in the US, that it wasn't quite clear who had responsibility. And uh, they may do some things that some crypto holders don't like, but I think what will emerge from it will be a good, strong regulatory system. And I think that will be very powerful. And other countries are at varying stages. You know, Singapore is very advanced in this. Switzerland, not bad. Um, the UK, I'm afraid, is really lagging, except in the tax system, where they understand all about crypto and love to tax it. <laughs> so getting back to the original, <laughs> the, uh, uh, the original question, so, Giles, do you see it as a hedge against inflation? Getting back to the inflation challenge, if you believe that inflation could now be enduring, 
one would this be a viable option to 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 hedge against that risk of inflation it would be in my portfolio along with some good equities that also give access to to to, to new technologies that are growing uh, have good medium term growth prospects how about you simon uh yeah, maybe maybe the same. I think that I think I would probably do that. Uh, I'd need to think a lot harder about how I am going to inflation-proof my uh, portfolio, though. <laughs> I'm a little bit uh, uh, I'm a bit puzzled by that challenge. So I'm, I'm glad I got the tutorial from Giles on this. Yeah. Well, you also think it's going to be more transitory the the inflation threat, right? Uh, I think that depends where. I think the evidence on that is really mixed across countries, actually. I think yeah. if you look in the US, you can make how the non-food and, and energy prices are changing. I think if you look in Switzerland, I mean, the, the, the big increases are in the classically tra transitory items. So I mean, let's just look at that kind of contrast. And I think there is a mix. And I think others have also highlighted that the inflation dynamics actually diverge quite a lot across the world. So. I don't think we can say we're back in the sort of 1970s type territory, um, either in terms of the level or the pervasiveness of inflation. Okay, that's good to know. That's good to hear that. So I'd like to ask, we have a couple of questions. Ask the group. Um, I, I, I wonder if we can put everyone on, uh, unmute everyone and everyone who wants to answer a question, please do so um, uh, uh, verbally. A couple of questions. I'm unable to unmute people. Um, is there anyone trying to speak who 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 would like to ask a question? Robert, we've got a couple of questions written down, or I think we may have covered them. I don't know if you look looked at those questions already written down. So as uh, Zani just wrote, anyone who has a question, please raise your hand to either Simon and and G or, or or Giles. Until otherwise I'll ask another question. So what type of equity sectors, Giles, would you Given your view that, that that it may be enduring and that one may have um, a, a degree of market disruption following any increase of of, of policy rates, um, what type of sectors would you focus on? I, I, part of the the kind of broad church known as tech, but not big tech, uh, which I think has has it will basically end up as a kind of semi-regulated utility within five years. I don't see how it can be anything else, to be honest, because it's it's become so pervasive. Well, either that or its competitive position will get so so eroded. So so tech that generally genuinely brings something new to the table rather than exploiting an existing monopoly. Um, and uh, I, I think the same applies again in another broad church, which is biotech, uh, where I think the the opportunities, I mean, I think they were good before the pandemic, but if there's any medium to long-term winner from the pandemic, it has to be the biotech sector, where the, I mean, the you know, what has emerged is such a, it's a true leap forward. It's just like, you know, when you have a war, you often get some, powerful technologies emerging from that. And I think that has absolutely happened with the M, uh, MR, you know, all the rest of it, fantastic stuff. Um, and, and you know, then you come to the question, do you buy the big pharma or do you buy some, uh, you know, whatever a portfolio of, of, of earlier stage, et cetera, et cetera, but the two. So, so I think those would be my two. And, and you know, the electric vehicle supply chain, uh, you know, it, there are clearly opportunities there as well. Um, interestingly, Robert, uh, well, I don't know if I'm allowed to attribute this comment to someone, but I was somebody recently said to me that they thought that the, uh, as it were, that if banking was a, a, a shark pool, then all, the automobile industry was an even worse shark pool. And I think there's a reason for that, which is that old auto has become all about rent seeking. 
uh, which is a dangerous state. But of course, it's now being in a way that actually banking hasn't quite yet been so challenged, but it now really is challenged by by really powerful startups, not just Tesla, but Rivian and and, and the, the Chinese, if they're allowed to, to import, et cetera, et cetera. So I, I think there'll be an incredible shakeup that was really only just begun in the auto industry. Um, even the kind of the ones who've been leading in the old guard, like Volkswagen, still look a bit sort of behind the curve to me. So, but the, anything to do with the new supply chain, I think will do very, very well. So, I mean, those are just a few random ideas, really. Yeah, those, those, those older OEMs actually have, they're the only ones in terms of valuation that are um, justifiable to, to buy if one is sort of a value investor because the valuations are, are quite attractive. Everything else is extremely expensive though, no Giles? Um, expense, as we've said, is all about where ultimately you think the medium term income streams are going. Yeah. And uh, I, I, I think some, uh, the, the kind of sectors I've just mentioned, I think will still prove to have value. You may say, well, if we're going to have a shakeout sometime next year, there'll be an opportunity to enter a bit cheaper. Well, that's probably true. But we can't always just hold back in, in the hope that that sort of thing's going to happen. It's difficult to time the market. Simon, go ahead, and then I have one yeah. last question for Simon. So, so uh, what I would just, if, if I had a couple of months to investigate some in, interesting investment prospects, I would start from the uh, assumption that governments are probably going to screw up the climate change transition, um, and that we will end up with higher temperatures than we would like and more disruption. And then it makes me think that there was probably an investment opportunity in the companies which are going to help with climate change adaption. So as we get used to a world which is hotter, I mean, we, presumably there must be companies which are going to build lots of dams, the infrastructure which protects from flooding, all of that stuff. And, and it's true, I tried looking, um, I could not find any funds which were targeting climate change adaption funds. Lots of people talking about climate change mitigation, but if you or pessimistic on COP26 and what comes after. Surely you, you want to look at a possible medium term uh, investments in companies which are going to help with coping with the uncertainty created by global warming. Okay, super. So, so and last question, Simon, I'd like to thank you very much. I'd like to ask to you, um, and it has to do with China in particular and um, more generally about um, uh, domestic production. So the last 30 years have seen an unprecedented shift away from producing almost anything in the OECD countries um, and, and really be having all these economies being increasingly service sector driven. Um, the US is boycotting the Chinese Olympics next year. If more countries do this, a lot of consumers are boycotting um, uh, uh, China-produced China products and services. Will Could this lead to increased domestic production of, of, of goods? Okay, I think there's a number of pressures which, are, which point in that direction, but I think the actual outcome of this is probably going to be very sector-specific. So there are going to be some sectors which are so locked into China and their uh, and with um, you know their, their cost structures uh, in uh, sort of aligned with this that they probably won't move. But there may well be other sectors which uh, repat uh, repatriate somewhat. And again, it may be a case of moving out of China into other parts of East Asia. Uh, but, uh, you know, you've got the pressures you've described. We've also got 3D printing. We've got concerns about our security of supply. I mean, all of these things push um, you know, towards either near assuring or bringing production back home. But again, I think it's very, very a product and sector specific how this plays out. Super, super, super. Um, thank you so much, Simon. This has been phenomenal, as always, with the two of you. Um, uh, it's been absolutely entertaining and 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 educational. Thank you so much for your insights. It's really been great. Uh, we look forward to having you in this constellation back again in the next couple of months. It's going to be also interesting to see how um, global inflation rates 
um, uh, 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 transpire in the next couple of months, uh, along with uh, central bank policies and the reaction of capital markets. So um, to, for giving us more insight on this, I'd like to thank both of you very, very sincerely. It's been fun and, uh, uh, as I mentioned, informative, and we really, really look forward to the next time. And until then, uh, we wish you a very, very happy holiday and Christmas season. And um, thank you again so much for joining us today. Thanks, Robert. Good to bye -bye. see you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.